everybody, we are live now. Hello. Uh, sorry about the panic and the waiting. I've actually not um, done a live stream on my channel before, or in fact, use Hangouts on air. So that was on me. Uh, and I hope you can't hear my main computer chugging in the background because it is uh, it is rendering a video. So. <laughs> There you go. Uh, guys, do you want to introduce yourselves? Uh, folks folks in the chat know who I am because they're used to seeing me on live streams at work. <laughs> uh, I can start then. So I'm Rachel. My channel is Colinati. And I can never know how to introduce myself. It feels weird to just say, oh, yes, I review science fiction and fantasy books online. <laughs> But that is pretty much all I do online. Uh, sure, I'm Diana. I currently do not have a YouTube channel, although that is changing because Claire and Chelsea are really Soon. Cool. <laughs> um, Soon. And I, re I have a lot of varied reading interests right now. It's a lot of stuff about plagues and epidemiology because diseases are really cool. Uh, okay, and I am Raya from the channel The Book Finch, and <laughs> I also don't know how to introduce myself like ever. Raya's a Finn, she's real salty. <laughs> Important information. Uh, Cool. Hi, welcome everyone in chat. I'm gonna keep an eye on chat and keep an eye on uh, the stream at the same time. So uh, for those of you who haven't seen our first Stitch and Bitch live stream or who haven't heard about our reading blanket projects, uh, we're all we're all here with large sashes of yarn, um, and we are making blankets, scarves, various projects that uh, track our reading because, you know, um, having YouTube channels about books is not nerdy enough. We have to, like, encode the reading within a blanket. We are waiting on a couple more people, uh, hopefully. And, yeah, we know uh, Diana has uh, an issue with her volume. This We were trying to figure it out whilst I was also trying to figure out how to set this up. Uh, and, yeah... I think that there was an incident with her uh, with her headphone microphone uh, recently, and so now she's having to use her computer. So uh, bear with that. We're just gonna make her be loud. I, I can try and be loud. There you go. Uh, do you guys wanna Do you guys wanna go ahead and talk a bit about uh, what you're reading right now? Sure. <laughs> I actually have my books with me. Yes. Last time I didn't. I'm, I'm always in the middle of so many things. I can't keep track of what I'm actually working on. So I'm reading The Pinho Egg, which I love these editions of these books. It's by Diana Owen Jones. It's the last of the Crestomancy books, and it's my my reread. Um, I have a terribly disgusting story about reading this the first time. So I'm trying to generate new memories while rereading this. Um, and then I got the new Flavia de Luce mystery novel from the library yesterday. I haven't started it yet, but I'm really excited. I may have surprised the librarian who was checking me out. She was like, wow, you're really into this, aren't you? <laughs> and then I'm working on this chunker, which is, what is this called? Power and Light is the second volume out of like six of all the collected stories of Roger Zelazny. And, uh, there's some really old like sword and sorcery stories in this collection, which are so boring. Yeah. <laughs> so boring. <laughs> I enjoy Rogers Lasney quite a bit, but the Dilvish stories, which is like his version of Conan the Barbarian fantasy world that he could just write serial stories in, it's so boring. I, I skim read all four of the first stories. I could not bear to pay more attention to them than that. Um, <laughs> so I kind of paused reading that after getting through those stories. So that's the main stuff I'm in the middle of. I also actually came well prepared and have the books. 
Um, I'm currently reading An Unkindness of Ghosts, but this is the Finnish edition. edition. And it's actually really hard for me to get into this book because it is so clear that this is a translated work. Like I can, like it feels like I'm reading it in English, but it's in Finnish because it's just so clunkily translated. So I'm going to give this another couple of chapters. And if it's not like getting any less clunky, I'm probably going to DNF and switch to the English version because there's some there's some uh, translatory clunkiness and I also have a Roger Zelazny book this is the Guns of Avalon and I'm gonna gonna start this next and I'm also listening Michelle Obama's memoir on audio so those are what I'm working on and uh, the um, An Unkindness of Ghosts that's by River Solomon yeah I think she's eligible for a Campbell this year. I don't, I'm not sure. I was trying to look into that. I don't think that the um, official listing of who's eligible has been updated yet, which is sad, but I think she's, or uh, they. What, what is her pronoun? They. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Is it they? They, yeah. That's what I don't remember. Said. I'm so sorry about that. Um, but I think they're in uh, their second year of eligibility. Yeah. They're on my Hugo ballot. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I'm working on this Hugo recommendation video, which is taking me a long time because there's just so many things to do. Uh, but I don't think I'm going to have enough people on my Campbell list to talk about because I don't really want to like give, you know, I don't really want to give like two or three recommendations. I want to have more than there are slots on the ballot just so that people don't think that I'm like saying exactly what to vote. Um, I know. So I'm not doing all the categories because I can't. <laughs> I actually decided to not do the Hugo recommendations video this year because I'm having so many problems. With, I have just enough picks for every category and I don't want it to appear like a slate. So I'm just like, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know people are really sensitive towards that these days. So I'm trying to be good. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm such a bad Hugo like uh, fan anyway because I rarely nominate because I, I keep reading like black uh, backlist stuff, so I'm never up to date on what's coming out and what's eligible. So I just wait for the um, voters packet to arrive. Then I try to read everything and vote accordingly. I mean, you know, like you're not a bad Hugo voter because you don't nominate. Like you do, you do as much or as little as you can do or want to do. You know, like that's just this this. I don't know. I'm I'm just so weary of like any kind of you know gatekeeping. You have to do it one way or another. Yeah, um, yeah. Don, yeah. what are you reading right now? Um, I am still. Hold on. I have so many books here. Um, I'm still. Ah, hi, cat. Um, <laughs> I'm still reading the Imperfect Justice one. I kind of paused on it because I had a lot more library books that were due um, first. Um, oh, you know, you told me about that book, but I did not realize it had that cover. That's certainly a choice. Yeah, well, because so I mean, it may the book is about the efforts to um, de get first get um, Swiss banks bank accounts that were initially opened um, by European Jews back to their descendants or to figure out what had happened to um, the Swiss bank accounts of uh, people who had been killed by the Nazis. Mm. Um, and so that was part of it. And then I'm getting to the second part of it now where they're getting trying to get reparations from uh, from mostly German companies that used slave labor during World War II. Yeah. Um, what else are you reading? And can I get you to try and shout? Because people in chat can't hear you. Uh, well, um, you know what I mean, shout. Yeah, I'm, I might switch computers and see if my other computer is working better. Yeah, uh, sure. So I might leave for a little bit, but I'm also reading a romance novel, but I'm going to go grab my Yeah, that might work better. 
I'll be yeah, back. for me as well because I uh, uh, I can I can't push my uh, headphones any louder than this. I'll, I'll be back. Cool. Uh, and yeah, uh, whilst we're waiting, uh, Rachel Michael in the chat wanted to know uh, if you've read alternate history. I know you prefer sci-fi, but I'm. I mean, I've, I've read alternate history before in the science fiction genre. It's it's really common in science fiction. I literally just uploaded a review of an alternate history oh my um, God, it's so good. science fiction novel. So <laughs> and that will be out in a couple of hours. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant The Haunting of Tram Car 015. No, no. no. I mean, good, that is alternate but... history, but I literally just got done editing a different review video right before coming to this <laughs> like this. So, um, Yes, I, I do read alternate history. Yeah, uh, and uh, The Haunting of Tramcar 015 is by P. Gele Clark, and I've just read that this month on audio. It was really, really cool. Uh, and yeah, that's like, yeah, that's a, it's an alternate history set in Cairo, and it's about a haunted tram car and like two agents trying to, two agents working for like this ministry of uh, weird occurrences. I can't, I should have written down like the actual wording of it because it's cool. Um, but they're just trying to figure out how to de-haunt the tram car. Uh, and then we've got, uh, we've got, what else did I just read? Uh, I just read uh, Alice Payne Arrives, which is a time travel novella which is uh, quite quite cool. I mean, it's, I don't know. I was just talking recently about a bunch of friends on Slack about like how, you know, there's been some good stuff in SFF in the past year. And we are currently like in this very lucky period of like great SFF coming out. But it's not like, you know, in other years, you're like, what are the great things? And there's like 10 of them, you know, there's just so many of them you can't like choose for something like the ballot, um, the Hugo ballot and whatever. And I feel like this year there are really more, um, there are really more like, um, like a more concentrated amount of stuff that is, you know, that that's come to prominence, if that makes sense. Now, there's a lot of crossover on all of the awards list, and I expect to see more when we get to the key guys. There's so like I also noticed that uh, in the last like say four years, like the 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 roster has become more colorful. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. not it's not pure white toast. <laughs> Like well, yeah, of course. That's there is really that... nice. Like I I've been really excited about all the new debut authors that are yeah. like on Twitter and promoting their books. And I've been just like, yes, more of this, please. Like I'm I'm just so thrilled of all the like new stuff that's coming out. And this was a very bad year to start my year long book buying ban. <laughs> <because laughs> <so> no. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm just, I, I I keep trying to make myself not buy as many books and then I just don't, you know, I, I did successfully not buy a single book in January. It was really hard. But wow. then I wasn't. But then I was in a bookstore, two bookstores in February, and like I, I, I have to get something. <laughs> I, I didn't have enough will. Yeah, but now you're allowed. Uh, well, technically, I shouldn't buy anything until May. You saving up so, for Worldcon? Um, well, I have an actual like limited budget each month, and I've pre-spent stuff. That's my problem. Um, so, but yeah, I'm I'm saving a lot of my my book budget for Worldcon. Mm -hmm. You you know I'm gonna show up and just be looking for all of the science fiction masterworks. <laughs> Obviously, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, hopefully we won't have as much of the issue that uh, we had at. Um, Worldcon 75 in Helsinki where there weren't that many bookstores at the convention at all because books are very heavy and bookstores didn't travel to the con. Hopefully we'll see like Dublin-based yeah. local bookstores. Uh, but we also like in the UK, we 
there are so many books we don't get, you know. Um, it's obviously, it's nothing on, you know, how tricky it is to find recent SFF in English in other, like, European countries, but... I feel like, like Dublin is so gonna be. Presses. I feel like Dublin is gonna be a bit di different because in mm. like, from what I've heard from reading the, the 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 progress reports, they are going to try and bring like indie publishers that are based in Ireland and also like all the UK publishers like are probably gonna have some sort of presence there, and. That was a problem in the Finnish World Con because Finland doesn't have like a lot of book publishers because we are so small. So, yeah, that that definitely was an issue uh, there as well. I would be so surprised if Golants doesn't have a presence. In oh yes. yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, like, in the, everything on my shopping list is going to be published by Golants. <laughs> That's all I'm hoping for. Looks so old, dudes, Denny. Look, I know they're trying. Have to travel with an empty. I know they're trip. trying, but I just I the SFF Masterworks list is really like like they could make more of an effort. You know, I've wondered how they choose books for the SF Masterworks line. I mean, it's been running for decades now. And I've honestly wondered if they're limited in what they can do, because essentially SF Masterworks are them getting reprint rights for the paperback editions of certain books. And I could see that being a real problem if they, if they can't get the rights for the paperbacks or something. But on the other hand, I keep reading books by women that I'm like, why isn't this in the SF Masterworks line, why. guys? <sighs> and it's a little annoying. But, you know, if you're doing a project like reading Clark Award winners or reading the Hugo and Nebula Award winners, you can find so many of those winners in that line. Yeah, I mean, look, rather you than me, friend, I think I wouldn't, uh, I really... Don't I've read all those doing... books, Claire, you won't like them. <laughs> I mean, I've looked at it. I've looked at it. maybe doing it at some point, but I just can't bring myself to it. I'm just, um, yeah. There, there, there are a lot of really good winners of the Hugo Awards and the Nebula Awards. There are a lot of really terrible books, too. And it's, you know, how, how strongly do you feel about reading all of them to know the context of the field or whatever? Mm -hmm. And yeah <laughs> yeah um is that sorry. to show that the times have really changed yeah uh, thomas was asking in the chat how do you find time outside of work and stuff to uh do as much reading as you do i've been on the same book for half a year and like literally my strategy aside from like reading six books at the same time um is that i just don't really I just don't really bother with books that I'm not enjoying anymore. Like I just stop. Um, and so, you know, I just, th th there's just not enough time to read books that I don't enjoy. And obviously that's very personal. Everybody chooses, you know, for, for, for themselves. But for me, I've just gotten to the point where I'm like, I would really love to be at a place where I have enough time for reading that I can do a project like that, you know. <laughs> But I literally find it hard enough to actually like finish all the books that I'm starting that I'm enjoying. <laughs> Cause I'm I'm so I so, I have a really short attention span, okay. <laughs> there are too many things to do. And I yeah, and I also, you know, if you're gonna put the time in like reading the awards shortlist, like if you have time to do current ones and and older ones, then great. But like, if I have time for any one set, then I'm gonna try and do like this year, right? Um, yeah. And speaking of this, this is what I'm reading right now: Space Opera by uh, Catherine M. Valenti. I want um, to read that one. 
So this is um, so this is the one where it's your vision in space, um, and the, the, I've never read a Cat Valenti book before, and I was not really expecting the like the lushness of the prose. I don't know if all of her books are like this, but yeah. there's literally a chapter that's like five pages of describing in such incredible amount of details like the moment this band like does their first concert and it's like five pages from their stepping up on stage to like they're shouting the name of the band and starting to sing like seriously i'm reading it before bed and it's just this nice slow pace and so it's just like i mean i'm not really super far into it um We've had the life story of this guy, uh, Decibel Jones, and then aliens have showed up and told him he has to do space Eurovision for the survival of the human species. And then he banged the alien. And now they've just like literally, they're putting the band back together now. It's like a hundred pages in. So. I, yeah, I, I felt like that experience. Book. I've been following her on Twitter for such a long time, and I was like, "Finally, a Cadwell book!" <laughs> like, wow, this is on crack. I I think space opera is pretty much Valenti at her least reined in. The the book is all style, very little substance. It's just I think she just had so much fun writing it. Um, I I thought it was a little out, out of hand, but I enjoyed the Eurovision and space aspect. It was very Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy mm -hmm. in the whole, you must show up and do this, or we will destroy planet Earth or whatever. <laughs> well, now I definitely want to read it. <laughs> way, way out there. Uh, not even trying to be logical. Um, so, I mean, I think if you like uh, Douglas Adams, you'll like space opera, but mm. yeah. But I... I oh, sorry. I would say my my favorite thing by Valenti is her Fairyland books for kids. It's I think just her her style, the lushness. Just I I think she has so much joy in using language, and it works so so well in the Fairyland books, and for kids. Oh yeah. Uh, by the way, I just um I said I followed her on Twitter for a long time, but that's because I used to listen to uh, this podcast called SF Squeecast yeah. that Valenti used to do with Sean and McGuire and the Thomases from Uncanny and Elizabeth Bear, who was on yeah. that, um, uh, uh, what's it, um, Paul Cornell, who was a writer mm -hmm. on Doctor Who before. So it was Paul Cornell, Bear, Seanan, Kat, the Thomases, and I can't remember who else, but it was this podcast where they would like squee about a thing every episode and it was just so joyful and that's where i know her from you know so i'm just like hey die hi is my is my uh, sound yes. better yes yeah. yes it worked okay. so good <laughs> um so hey. uh, i'm gonna round back a little bit to the uh, question about how do you find time to read and i'd say that the best thing is to have an hour-long commute <laughs> that you have to do <laughs> yeah. on public transport because that way I like I I get two hours a day of reading um, just by commuting to university mm. and then also uh, I've recently started um, taking advantage of audiobooks so when I'm doing laundry or cleaning up the house or something then I will just put on an audiobook and that way I get some reading done yeah, I used to have a longer commute and I would get a ton of reading done. And now that um, I'm living in a smaller town and my commute's a lot shorter, I need it takes a lot more like planning to set a set aside time to like do some reading. Yeah, and there's definitely like if you you have you just have to make time for it. For example, I play a lot less like games nowadays than I used to uh, because I just um, am currently in our reading kick so maybe that will change at some point and I will just disappear and play PlayStation 24 hours a day 
<laughs> and you don't worry, I will need to and... update the PS online and you won't get 24 hours worth of it. It'll be fine. <laughs> you can read whilst uploads are down updates are downloading. Or you can Ooh. read Ooh. while you're determined to trigger the Iron Bull Dorian romance banter and Dragon Age Inquisition, even if that means just plopping them down somewhere for hours. I mean, I got Final Fantasy XV Christmas, and the first, I swear, four hours of my Final Fantasy experience was downloading all of the DLC and updates that had occurred okay. in the like two years since the game released. Well, I don't yeah. know what you guys are talking about because I never had to edit any Dragon Age videos because John still won't do them, so I don't know that game. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, ha <laughs> ha. Thomas in chat says if John was there, he'd mock the Dragon Age mention. I did it for him. Uh, there you go. And uh, yeah, Zephy recommends Sabriel. I've not read that series. Anyone really? Oh it? my god, I love that series so much. Um, I have the first book. Book. Uh, I, I, I really want to read it. I haven't read the newer ones yet, but the original books were like very much my jam when I was younger. And a friend actually did this really cool Sabriel cosplay, and she like actually found like the fabric, like someone made the fabric that they use for like the coats and everything it's really cool That's like, the bells, like the bandolier of bells or yeah whatever. um so, so cool. she's on instagram if you go to chaos bria she has some photos of like her various cosplays including the sabriel stuff i really love it when people do like um cosplay from like books or mm. like stuff that isn't visual because I really love that that sort of like you get to design your own like interpretation of the costumes in and that character. And I just find it really uh, fascinating and fun. Like um, that's what I try to do as well when I'm doing like uh, cosplay work. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, since I got I had to leave because my mic was being yes. terrible. Um, aside from the Imperfect Justice, I'm also reading a romance book uh, by Mia Hopkins called Thirsty because I guess it's going to be the next book club pick for One in Romance. And one of my libraries happened to have it, so I decided to check it out. Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm... I'm wanting... I'm always wanting to make time to read more romance novels, but like especially recently with the plagiarism shenanigans that have been happening on Twitter that have been unfolding over Twitter. What's uh, that about, really? Like I've, I've okay, been, well, like the rabbit hole. I I haven't gotten that far into it. The so tea. Like well, <laughs> it's just in so many different directions, right? What happened is. Uh, a reader alerted Courtney Milan, who is like a best-selling romance writer who, you know, happened to be a clerk on the Supreme Court um, yeah. and is a lawyer specializing in IP that some of her book had been plagiarized. Like there's some word for word, like, you know, side by side, really shot, like pretty obvious. Uh, um, stuff that that she's posted on her Twitter, and like from that point, from like seeing this author, uh, Christian Cerullo, um, and like what from from that one piece of plagiarism, like they traced her plagiarizing from like 15, 20 different authors, like and across also her various like books, plagiarizing recipes. Oh my god, like plagiarizing just like any old, like you know, here's a like Wikipedia page about this thing, you know, like just every time she wanted to explain something. Sorry, that was there was something on my but, uh, on my computer. But anyway. how isn't that li like really obvious? Like, I mean, it is really job. obvious. And also, if you're gonna do it, maybe don't do it to someone who's a freaking IP lawyer. Well, and and then she was all. Oh, well, I used a ghostwriter and it was the ghostwriter's fault. And so two of, not for this particular book, but 
two other ghostwriters she had worked with in the past were like, yeah, so first of all, she sent us all these mishmash scenes that didn't make any sense. So we had to like make them make sense. So it looks like she like plagiarized the stuff and sent it to the ghostwriters to put into something more coherent. Right. And then she like didn't pay them. Yeah, and also she was saying that she hired those ghostwriters on Fiverr and but, like then people started looking up like how much people get paid to write words on Fiverr and it was like, you know, I don't know, like five dollars for thousands of words, you know, like something that's really just like you're not even talking about below the minimum wage is like just scraping you can't eat food you know and it's just the, the... but yeah also she apparently plagiarized from Nora Roberts and it turns out Nora Roberts is apparently like a dragon lady and is going to uh you know she's not on Twitter so it took her a couple of days to like figure it out but now that she's heard about it these people are all fucked. Oh yeah, yeah I, read her, I read her. Like, Nora Roberts has amazing. Like, <laughs> her, um, so like her net worth could hire like a bunch of like lawyers. All right. I mean, doesn't she? Didn't she literally end the blog post with "I'm coming for you"? I know. <laughs> Be afraid. <laughs> yep. I have never read any of her books and I never really had a high opinion of them, but I really love her now, <laughs> just as a person. The audacity of pe some people. Well, and it sounds like this isn't the first time like something like this has happened to Nora Robert. Like she, in yeah. her blog, like in her blog post, she was talking about this other thing. And so like, it, she has the money, she has the connection to just like make, to like take, people down and like take care of it mm -hmm. but a couple of months ago when when she had that beef with um you know um tommy Adeyemi, uh she also in that blog post um referenced a situation where she herself had been plagiarized and that's why she was really upset of yeah the, but i mean like that's just tommy Adeyemi being like a new writer and yeah just, yeah yeah like I'm that's, so that's yeah, like that. I'm not, I'm not getting into that, but I mean, no, I like, mean, I just I, felt that's just that's just uh, I remember that she's very uh tight on plagiarism accusations, so that's what I was uh, going no, after. No, no, I know what you mean, I know what you mean. I just, you know, then and again, now I just feel bad because I'm like, what, where, where were Tommy out of Yemi's people to stop her <laughs> doing that? Yeah, because, you know, like that was yeah. just not. That's the kind of thing. Like, you're supposed to text your friend and be like, "Is this a thing?" And your friend can be like, "That's not how book titles work." Yeah, <laughs> or you know, your agent or yeah, whatever. That. The people who you are paying to do that work for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not, I'm not even. I'm not even mad because, like, if you if you think about it, I I just. Uh, generally, uh, if if like going back to that thing for a bit, um, I generally think that when young female authors do stuff, they get scrutinized way more than someone like, for example, Terry Goodkind's assholery about the whole cover art thing. That was just a blip in the radar. Like, and people are still yeah. mad at this thing that, like, really nobody got hurt in the end. Just no, just. You know, calm down. Let people live. I mean, to be fair, the guy who designed the cover for Terry, good kind, like good kind, showed his ass in public at exactly the right time that this guy ended up on the Hugo ballot last year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. also the new Terry Goodkind has a different uh, the the sequel to that book that he berated the cover um, has a different cover artist. Yeah, I wonder I mean, why. <laughs> For sure, for sure. I mean, you know, the guy, um, the guy with the French sounding name that I don't remember is clearly a very, you know, is clearly a very good artist that's made like a really great cover. But you know, uh, it was just it's funny how it worked out. Um, cool. Let's see. 
Ooh. Okay. Um, what are how, how are you guys' projects progressing? Because I have not touched my thing since last stream, and I'm like trying to make sure that the stream is working fine, and I'm like still not started doing anything with my hands, and it's been 45 minutes. I'm mostly caught up on my scarf right now. Um, it's gonna be long, which is good. Um, so I'm working on, on a different project right now. Um, I am like, I have the quilting stuff. So I've made the first like batch of quilt material. Uh, but since I'm doing it on a sewing machine, I usually don't work on it during the stream. So yeah. I'm doing my rainbow gloves right now. Oh, nice. They look super cute. They are, like, I love them. I, I'm going to crochet a kind of, like, lace um, on the borders. And then also the thumb is going to be the same color as the border. Cool. Mm. Mm. I am also working on gloves. I'm starting ribbing for just something I'm making up right now. I haven't worked on my book Afghan at all since the last live show, but I don't have much catch up to do on it. So I'm working on other things today. Ooh. So let's see. I'm not, I'm not doing novellas or comics in mine. And that's pretty much all I read in February. So not much of what I read is going to go into it. Oh yeah, I've literally finished, I finished six things so far this year, all comics and novellas. Like I've started a bunch of novels. I'm reading a novel right now. Like right now I'm reading Space Opera. I'm still reading, um, I'm still reading the um, History of the Hugos by Joe Walton, which I was reading before bed quite consistently last month. But then I realized that I'm not sure if I actually want to nominate it for a Hugo because a friend pointed out uh, that those blog posts actually like came out some years ago and then not from 2018. The book's from 2018, but there's like literally a little passage at the beginning of the book that's like talking about how she and her editors, the Nielsen Haydens, uh, Teresa and Patrick Nielsen Hayden, like spent a weekend putting it together. And I feel like, you know, like all three of them are very smart and talented industry professionals that know what they're doing. But I feel like maybe if they were able to make all these changes in just one weekend, like, you know, that's, I know, it's, I, I, know it's, I know it's already like 16. I, I, I know two work days from three industry professionals is not nothing. Right. But I feel like I'm not sure if I think that, counts as enough change for me to put it on my ballot you know what i mean yeah well i i mean i, I believe that most of the material is exactly the way it was originally on the mm. on the tour.com blog i didn't even think about that but is it actually eligible i mean literally is it eligible? yeah i don't know the the th <laughs> yeah i think the thing with eligibility for the hugos is that usually this is a very broad, you know, blanket thing that's not, that can change depending on the administration, administrative teams and stuff. But usually people voting have the eligibility criteria given to them, people nominating. And if people are nominating a thing that doesn't have like a cut and dry eligibility rule like this was published last year like this was published in 2016 and not in 2018 if there is a question of it it often comes down to how many people actually nominate it like the you know, and the voters get to decide ultimately yeah Although I, I think more that's the genre like what what do you consider as genre eligibility well, that's true. We had that. We had that before, right? Because we yeah. had um, oh, that Wasn't beautiful, there? beautiful story. If you were a dragon, if you were a dinosaur, my love is was that what it was called? I think there were actually multiple stories all in one year. There was Wakula Springs by Ellen Clages and Andy Duncan. There was uh, the Water That Falls on You from Nowhere by John Chu. It was clearly speculative. 
That was and then, what? Only got you from nowhere. And, and the Swirsky story. I think they were all nominated in like the same year, which was around the beginning of the the big puppies debacle, yeah. where they were like, people are nominating things that aren't even really SFF for the awards. And and I think somewhere in in the rules, it actually says like we interpret what's eligible based on what the voters actually think. If if yeah. enough people nominate it and they think that it is speculative fiction, we're going to run with it. <laughs> I mean, also it was published in a speculative fiction magazine, so that's that. Um. Isn't it interesting, wh like, where things are published colors your perception of how genre it is or not? Yeah. Like, there, there are a lot of um, Ursula Le Guin stories that were published in essentially literary fiction magazines. And it's like, do you think of that more as her literary fiction or her speculative fiction? I mean, that's always a little, you know, <clears throat> that, that's always a little more tricky, I think, because you're then wading into the idea of what is it that, you know, all the things that come with the distinction between literary and SFF, where mm. so many people have used that distinction <laughs> in a disparaging manner. And, you know, I mean, this is one thing that I really, that I thought was really interesting in the Joe Walton uh, book, um, the, An Informal History of the Hugos, that, um, where she talks about how SFF, it, particularly Hugo fandom, is so wedded to its history. Um, and has such a long memory for stuff and is quite judgy. And she says a line like, SFF still hasn't forgotten Margaret Atwood for saying that The Handmaid's Tale wasn't speculative. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, you know, I, I've definitely been angry about that before. <laughs> <laughs> so I see that. But yeah, it's... Um, I don't think that where it's published necessarily, you know, is so important of a thing about it's because genre is relatively fluid and I don't think where something is published really affects genre that much. No, but, I think my point is not not that it actually changes the genre, but it can influence how people interpret its genre. For sure. Yeah. That's true. Uh, or like, um, cause I know there's been discussion going back to Noah Roberts and I haven't read, um, this series. So I don't, I'm taking it on what others have said, but her JD Rob ones, like everyone talks about how it's like romantic mystery and stuff, but apparently there's like very much like a near future SF, SF aspect to it. And like, Every, like I said, because it is Nora Roberts, everyone talks about the romantic aspect and not necessarily the near future component to mm -hmm. it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's the same. It's funny. I was, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I follow on Twitter one of the, well, I follow both of them, but uh, I was talking on Twitter with one of the uh, two uh, women who write under the pseudonym Kit Roker. Uh, and they write, you know, uh, they write this like dystopian future erotica, which is, you know, very popular in uh, the romance genre. But like, they are a romance writing team, right? Or oh, that's what I've always known them as. And um, and you know, they are publishing a book with Torbox next year that is like, I'm sure we'll have romance you know, a strong romance element to it, but like they're just publishing a sci-fi novel and it's really cool to see and to see more of a kind of, you know, I guess less like strict boxes, um, especially when you consider the fact that like how much of the same bullshit do romance readers and genre readers and romance writers and how much of the same bullshit do romance readers and writers and sci-fi and fantasy romance and writers and horror and all of that, like how much of the same bullshit do we all have to like cope with from <laughs> mainstream literary blah, 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 yeah. when actually like the only difference between them is a relatively, you know, like an entrenched 
gendered aspect to both of the genres, which is not, you know, true because like, <laughs> you will be shocked to hear we've had women and, and folks of all gender enjoying science fiction and fantasy for a very, very Wait, long you mean time. They're writing science fiction and fantasy and they aren't just automatically writing YA, Claire? <laughs> I just find it really absurd that people are pissing on genre fiction, yet literary fiction uh, in the last couple of years has really started dipping its toe in the speculative. And I'm here like, <clears throat> tell me more. <laughs> I mean, look, dragons and spaceships are just cooler than, you know, yeah. a novel about a professor who, like, wants to have an affair with a student and buy a fast car because he's feeling or another Or another, like, treatise on the effect of alcoholic, alcoholic <laughs> parents on uh, children. But you can do all of that. But also have spaceships and dragons and yeah, like smoochies. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I get that, you know, spaceship, dragons, smoochies, like that's not for everybody. People can pick and choose. That's fine. You don't like have to, you know. But what I'm saying is my tastes are better than everybody else's. <laughs> <laughs> and it's my channel, so I can say that. <laughs> like, there, it's actually kind of um, like Black Leopard Red Wolf just came out. And I've oh, yeah. seen so many uh, people who are like literary fiction booktube channels, they have gotten the book and they're really excited about it. And I'm like, is it just because Marlon James is a man booker winner? <laughs> like, or, or like, it's just funny to me. No, I see what you're saying. I mean, I was super excited about Black Leopard, Red Wolf, and then um, some of the like content so some people started reviewing it and like started talking about how like violent it is and i was just like oh i really don't want to do that I, like, you know like it's I'm, not to I'm say really anything about specifically like the quality of the book because i haven't read it but um you know amal motar reviewed it and talked about how reading the book was like getting slowly eaten by a bear and enjoying the pain. Was like, that, that was my experience with you know? reading uh, The Traitor Baru Cormorant just a couple of weeks ago. Like, my heart is a desert of broken glass, was what I said afterwards. Uh, so, like, I'm really excited for Black Leopard, Red Wolf, but based on, like, Thomas's review, mm. I uh, think... Over at SMF 180. I think I'm gonna wait until after I've uh, gotten over the whole Baru Cormoran thing because I, I just can't do like that level of violence and uh, soul crushing defeat in one go. That makes sense. I mean, I just, I read the monster Baru Cormoran and like, you know, I liked it, but I was so angry at the ending of it. Um, oh no. So oh no. Like, I was so angry at the traitor Baru Cormorant's ending. Glad to see that that's a theme that's going to continue. Well, you know, I'm not reading traitor Baru Cormorant uh, because I just don't, like, yeah. I mean, I, I, I like the first book. I just didn't really... Oh, so... I, just, I didn't think it actually built the twist at the end, you know? Like, there's a twist at the end of the book, and sometimes when you have, like, a book with a twist at the end, or, um, you know, any kind of media with a twist at the end, sometimes you can go back and look back and be like, oh, they planned it all along. And I feel like with the Traitor Baru Court, with the monster... Uh, traitor is the first one. Sorry, with the Traitor Baru Cormorant, I was so confused. With the Traitor Baru Cormorant, I felt like the twist at the end of that... Um, I just didn't really get, get it, you know. Um, yeah, I can I can kind of see where you're where you're coming from. Like I didn't I didn't mind it. Uh, it 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 broke me mentally, but um, I can definitely see that um, where you would want more uh, like foreshadowing and development for that uh, particular ending to be more effective. Right, because when you get, like, emotionally invested in a thing, 
and then something happens and it gets flipped and you're like, we what? Like, it feels like treason to you, which, like, the book has traitor in the title, so perhaps we should have known. <laughs> but, like, yeah, it's just... It's kind of like when uh, Adam Silvera wrote we both die at the end and there were people that well i thought it was a metaphor for something i didn't expect them to they both die die. At the end. yeah 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 they both die at the end is about a world where like they know that they only have a day left to live and then they have like a cutie romance and then they both die at the end because that's the premise of the book but I appreciate the upfrontness, you know, like they both die at the end. It's like having a tag for major character death on your fanfic. <laughs> like, I like that. Anyway, I'm not going to. Um, yeah. Seeing as all of you aren't in the UK, you might not know this about the Traitor Baru Cormoran, and it kind of ties in with the conversation we had before about genre. But uh, did you know that in the UK they sold the Traitor Baru Cormorant as the Traitor? And instead of having that yeah. cool cover with like the, the mask that was a face shattering, it was just like a Grecian looking mask and it could yeah. have been like. Huh. Any yeah, I read that Mando particular historical edition. novel. Interesting. I don't know why they did that. And then they did the same thing with the, the monster as well. I'm like, why? Why? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, my, my problem with them changing the title is it was just so generic after that point. Yeah, yeah I actually had, like, because I had only heard of uh, like Traitor Baru Cormor and Monster Baru Cormor. And then I went to my library uh, to uh, put a hold on it, like to the website, and they only had the Traitor. And I was really confused and thought that, do I have the right book? Like, am I putting a hold on a completely different book right now. So I just had to like wait and see. But maybe you're putting coming. a hold on a book with a better ending though. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Uh, <laughs> folks, do you have, what, what, do you have grand plans of what you're planning to read next? My next reading project is going to be uh, reading some BookTube SFF awards uh, finalists because, of course, uh, uh, you know, finalist list is out now. Judging is happening in the next few months. Well, judging, reading is happening in the next few months. And then we have to vote on stuff, and it's pretty exciting. Um, but aside from that, before the Hugo's finalists come out, I don't really have, like, big projects <laughs> that I'm working on. I might finally do that new canon Star Wars read, reread, read through that I keep threatening to do to myself, mostly because I keep buying the books and then not reading them. Die, if you start a YouTube channel about books, it'd be a great project to chart on that new YouTube channel about books that we definitely want you to be doing. Yeah. Um, Just I think mean, it'll about be it. You have four subscribers at least from the get go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so like, especially with Star Wars, like the new canon stuff, um, like there's, there have been things that they've planted in books that like come out later and you're just like, oh shit, I did not see that coming. And also there's a rumor about who a new character is going to be in episode nine. And if it's true, that'll be great because they'll be bringing in a book character, not Ray Slo Sloan, unfortunately, um, but they'll be bringing in a book character who is terrible and I hate him, but it would also be very cool. Uh, just before we continue, I just want to say uh, there's quite a few people in chat going like, um, uh, so the main, the, today's main video on Menu of Truna, which is the channel I, I work at, which a lot of people know me from, uh, there, there's a massive video out like right this second. That's like two hours and a half of deep analysis about Fallout 76. And a few wow. people are jumping off to say they want to go and see that. Uh, that's super okay. That video has been such a labor of love. Like, uh, please go enjoy that. <laughs> that I think like, I'm going to go watch that after this. <laughs> please do. Please do. It's pretty great. I mean, you know. 
just the to problem is John is if I say nice things about John, John he's gonna hear me because he's in the next room uh, but uh, but yeah no it's, it's pretty great I did the, I edited the like um the I did a first draft uh, edit pass on the audio of that video so I know like the he's done like 50 pickups on it so I'm sure it's changed quite a bit but like it was really interesting so uh you know um Anyway, it was really interesting, and I don't even like I'm 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 not really a Fallout player at all, and I was quite interested. So there you go. The last one I played was uh, Fallout New Vegas. Well, <clears throat> yeah, that's the one that people generally agree is the best one. Um, that's the, I, I mean, I don't. You know. I just generally don't like. I I find myself like having changing tastes when it comes to like video games nowadays mm. like i'm much more into like very heavily story driven stuff that mm. has like like i like exploring but i feel like it has to have a purpose and a meaning to it yeah um and the new fallout games much like the new elder scrolls games actually i think are more about aimless wandering and waddling about than actually like accomplishing anything so, you know. Yeah, I tend to go with, so I don't play a whole lot of video games, but the ones that I tend to play are more RPG related. So like yeah. the Bioware stuff. Um, I really liked Horizon Zero Dawn. Oh, that's like, I'm playing that one as well. I mm. love it. I have a lot of feelings about it. I know that if Sony does, the thing where they're like, oh, by the way, we're releasing a PlayStation 5 and we're having a bundle with uh, the just announced Horizon Zero 2, Horizon Zero Dawn 2, I will buy it in a heartbeat because yeah, same. I, <clears throat> I like, need I'm also like um, currently in the pro, like Horizon Zero Dawn has this awesome camera mode where you can just take screenshots and pictures of all the different angles of all the weapons. It's like a cosmate, cosplayer's wet dream. <laughs> so I've um, basically been going through all of the armors and just taking reference shots of everything. Which is the really fun thing about Horizon Zero Dawn is actually like most of what I know it for is actually like cosplayers who I follow yep. who made like really, really detailed alloy costumes. I mean, I'm assuming, you know, if you're into um, you search, follow a lot more people than me, but yeah, like search, you know, you Atlanta and cosplay. If you if you if you don't follow Kamui cosplay, um, go check her out. She has these really in depth um, videos about how she makes her costumes and how she also, makes her there's armor. There's corgis in the videos, and they're yeah. fucking cute. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. and I've been following Svetlana like her blog for like you know eight years or something. But, yeah, same. But like, they used to not make, they, they didn't really make YouTube videos. Like they had a few videos that were like tutorials in German subtitled. Yeah. Uh, but then they've now started making more regular YouTube videos and they look really great. And it's really like, yeah, it's, it's, it's just really. Uh, like I've also bought Svetlana's books. So I'm, I'm just trash for her. <laughs> like. I'm not uh, even to be honest, like it. one of my favorite things about her is how blatantly she'll be like, "Buy my books," because yeah. she needs to buy her books because it's her job. And I'm like, "Yes, more people should be really like." She's you know, very unapologetic like, about like pushing yeah. her product, and I love her, love her for it because I I think it's great that she's very proud of doing it as a job, and you know, um, yeah, and also like you know, people who t I, I mean. <sighs> You know, if she's pushing it by saying "buy my books" at the beginning of the video in like an open manner, then she's not like doing weird underhanded shit later, like doing you know sponsored content and not declaring it. Which I mean, she's in Europe, so that's illegal in Europe. But plenty of people do that. Like plenty of people making videos like in the US do that. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and it's I a very like big problem. For all. example, in like makeup beauty guru. Um, oh man, I remember this. I was watching this guy who made cooking videos, and I can't even remember the name of the channel, but it was a few years back, and I was and he made a video that was like 
to cook your Thanksgiving turkey, the best way to season it is to use this like random like vinaigrette sauce from this brand. And like, I know they paid you because no one makes turkey that way because it sounds gross. <laughs> like you should just tell us that they paid you anyway, anyway. Right, uh, books though, books are a thing. Sorry, oh, yeah, we, really we went bad. on a completely like I'm just random really bad at tangents. I'm just really bad at tangents, and you know, I I know that Raya is there in the tangent minds with me, um, so that I, I I appreciate that. But anyway, if people didn't want, if people wanted cosplay recommendations. You got them now. Uh, and uh, yes, books. Um, I am super, super excited about the Vela. The Vela. I don't know how we're choosing to pronounce that, but um, it's a serial novel coming out from this website called Serial Box, like starting next week or something. Is that when it's starting? I, I signed up for it and I was like, shouldn't this be out already? <laughs> Uh, it's starting r relatively soon, I think. Um, and it's, yeah, I think it's starting soon because I got like a a promo for it. I got a promo email for it the other day that was like, you know, if you can't wait to start on the Vila, buy some of our other stuff 25% off. Yeah. Oh. And I might, this, this I is might the one I... I I subscribed to it immediately because it had Yoon Holly's name on. I'm like, sold. <laughs> Yoon Holly, Rivers Solomon, Becky Chambers, wow. and another person who's equally cool. Shit. Okay. Let me Google it. Brain fart. Th those are the three that I immediately recognized. Yeah. So I was like, Tre Tremont 10 is ending or has ended, and I, I need I need a new serial box to follow. So I'm, I'm waiting for the hardcover releases of the rest of the Tremont 10 because I just oh, and SL Hong the idea smart. of serialized stuff, Ooh, but yeah. I I can't follow them. Yeah, I listen yeah. to all of Tremont 10 um, on audio because the the audio productions are fantastic. They've kept. Um, Catherine Kelgren as the Duchess Tremont 10. She's been the voice of the Duchess Tremont 10 for decades now, I think. And she does such a good job. Interesting. Yeah. I might have to look into that, like the audio versions. I do want to um, get the one that they did with Gwenda Bond, um, Dead Air, just because there's another like book podcast um combo that I want to that I'm on hold on for and I kind of want to read and compare the two because they're both like very different they're both takes on like the true crime podcast and they have accompanying podcasts yeah a lot of people in the chat are saying that they're not loving the serial format and I have to say I'm usually not into the serial format but I also got a review copy of the Vela so I don't have to do the serial format lucky duck like, I, I know I it's like, I'm like, always missing see. missing some stuff. Like if I if like, we have a like following following a serial is kind of makes me anxious. Kind of like if you have a TV show that you need to watch. Chelsea, hello friends. Hello. Better late than never. Hi. Hello. Hi. Well, I have been watching. I have been waiting for the red rat to finally go to sleep, but I have been watching everybody. How is how is everybody doing? Yay. Wait, a challenger has appeared. Mm. Cool. Ooh, Chelsea, so, do you want to tell us what you're reading and what you're doing? Oh, goodness. Uh, I am alternating back and I'm trying to get uh, somewhat caught up for book two of the SFF because it's a thing that's happening like now. Surprise! Uh, <laughs> Is how I feel pretty much all the time during the award season. Chelsea talked me, well, Chelsea didn't talk me into it. She asked and I said yes immediately. But <laughs> she, also said, she also said, oh, don't worry, there won't be too much reading because it's likely to be stuff you've already read and I've like read none of them because apparently <laughs> I'm not into the stuff that the cool kids on BookTube like. 
asterisks and caveats but <laughs> uh it would be a lot less reading if i had any kind of memory retention but like so one of the murder bat books and then beneath the beneath sugar skies or whatever it is the wayward children yeah book are both nominated and it's been long enough since i read the first couple mm. and their novellas that i was like i'm just gonna go back and reread them yeah fair enough like, so that's the- what i've been doing the Murderbot books I read, Hi, like, Pat. oh, hello. Oh, kitty. Um, the, murder book, the Murderbot novellas, I read the first one when it came out, and then I read the th- next three, mm. like, within a week of each other. <laughs> yeah. So I have no idea which one Artificial Condition is. I mean, I know it's, like, the second one, but I have no idea what happens in it because it's all smushed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So and like I, it's like it was just it's a me thing. It's been long enough since the last awards that I'll probably go back. We have enough sequels that I'll just go back and reread. Yeah, a bunch of them. I make more work for myself than I actually need to. But what else is new? <laughs> yeah. Um. Cool. Okay. So, what are you making, Charles? Uh, I am, I was very inspired by the pictures Rachel put up of her virus shawl that she finished not too long ago. So I went online and I found a pattern that's a combo virus shawl and granny stitch. That is what I did around the border of mine. Mm -hmm. So it's just that these. Might rip it back and do more of it. It's so pretty. Yeah, it's really pretty. So it alternates these like kind of holy virus sections with just sections of plain granny stitch. And so I picked up these really my horrible lighting, you can't tell, but it's like pastel greens and blues and purples and like spring colors. So I'm hoping I can like force spring to get here faster by working in the appropriate color palette. <laughs> You're adorable. <laughs> yeah, so far it's not working, but we'll be forever <laughs> Uh, I recently bought these, um, let me see, I think I have them, um, I bought these, like these are like Moomin um, um, patterns for like Ooh. socks and stuff, so that's probably what I'm going to try and um, do after I finish, finish these gloves, because I'm kind mm-hmm. of trying to um, reacquaint myself with knitting and getting more into like the harder, more difficult stuff. And right now I'm just trying to remember how to do like right stitch and purl. Mm-hmm. Um, Di, did you end up buying the subscription box for knitting stuff that you were talking about? Hold on, for, I'm like, I'm doing a pattern and I'm trying to, um, I have not yet just because um, this month had a little bit of an, un- not completely unexpected expense, but I had to buy new glasses. So mm-hmm. um, I'm holding off till next month when my budget resets. Yeah. I really like the look of that nitpicks box. I really like their yarns. I'm actually using a uh, nitpicks yarn right now. I'm sorry. Um, I'm trying to make a cowl. Um, so I'm using some fancy yarn. Hi, Kat. Hi, Kitty. She um, has some opinions about a lot of things. <laughs> as as do all cats. Yeah, which, I had a which is why we love them. I had a question about knit picks for those of you who use it. Mm-hmm. I've been trying. I've been shopping around to try and find yarn because I want to make this sweater again. Mm-hmm. But I noticed that knit picks always seems to have just small quantities of things. Like you can buy a ball of like a hundred yards of yarn. I'm like, I, I need like 1200 yards. Do I need to buy that many balls or can you get it in larger quantities? So I don't want to be time. In my, <laughs> uh, in my experience, it's knit picks prices low for smaller amounts. Mm-hmm. So I usually do the, the, I think it's the DK swish. That's like their all purpose DK. That's like half acrylic base. So it's really easily washable and stuff. So if you're not an acrylic fan, that might not work for you, but um, it's like four ninety nine for, I want to say like 200 yards, 150 yards. So, I mean, when I have made sweaters from them in the past, it has been like a 10, 11, balls of yarn like kind of situation so (laughs) yes 
I will probably end up using it at some point because I'm I'm trying to find a lightweight green yarn and mm -hmm. Hobby Lobby has nothing in green right now. So <sighs> that's are probably you, the Are you looking for because um the yarn that I'm using for my scarf, um, you you I mean it the problem is it's small quantity, but I like if I can find the green. I like the green that I have from them. Yeah, I'm looking for like a really deep emerald green. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the, like that's like the biggest, I think one of the best selling points of Knit Picks is like, they don't sell in huge quantity, but like their color selection across their fiber range is like usually really impressive. Like when I was make, looking to make like the book scarf for this year and I needed like a bunch of different shades of similar colors, like yeah. they had a lot of that available. Yeah. I feel like I need to find a knitting project to start because this blanket that I'm making right now, I'm making um, crocheted hexagons and mm -hmm. they are very cute, but you have to pay attention to like the numbers of stitches and stuff. And so like, I can't actually do that while I'm talking to you guys. I, I made like one of them in the last stream and I'm like struggling to even start now. I feel like I need to reserve time to do this blanket, like, you know, in the evening when I'm listening to an audiobook or something. <laughs> that's what I pretty much do 85% like, of the time. You know, get a project that's like a repetitive enough stitch that I don't have to think about it. Um, but also I really, I don't actually, you know, I really want to do, I really want to do um, that like dragon scale motif that uh, you found, Rachel. Oh, Check it out, Stitch. Is yeah. that the crocheted one or or the knitted one that Brie found? Ooh. Because there are both. You can do the same stitch with both. Yeah, I've been doing most of my knitting while I've been catching up on Critical Role. Well, those are long episodes. I was going to say, that's like four hours at a time. So that's plenty of like time to get caught up. Oh man, I, mean, I really, I mean, it sounds I so, so cool, but I cannot afford to get into that. Like, because I would get nothing done. <laughs> I, I have a. Yeah, I. Go ahead, Beth. I, um, well, I tend to watch it in two chunks. So I'll watch like an episode up until the break, and then the next day or a few days later, I'll watch the second half. So, like, it ta it's been taking me a while to catch up, but it's. It's hard for me to watch it in one one go. Yeah. I just find this show so daunting to get caught up on because, like, not only do they have a gajillion episodes per season, literally each one is, like, three yeah. to five hours long, depending on, like... So, and I, like, love to binge stuff. I'm a pro at binging media, but even that, for me, is, like, a very large mountain to climb. And that's if you're just starting with, like, their second season and not trying to go back and listen to the, like, yeah, 100-something episodes of the first arc no, or whatever that tried. they did. I haven't even tried for campaign one. I'm, like, at this point, I'm just, like, trying to get caught up with campaign two. So one of the many things I love about The Adventure Zone is that those episodes are, like, 45 minutes long or, like, an hour and 20 minutes long, which is just much more easy to get caught up on or listen to in a binge. Yeah, I've been, I just started the Adventure Zone uh, graphic it's, novel because it's, obviously so it's, a, it's, it's a nominee for the Booktube SFF Awards in the graphics mm -hmm. category, and I'm judging that. Um, but but I, feel like I, might need to go, I feel like I might need to go and listen to a few you of those episodes to, to like hear the voices of the people. Well, the thing is, the thing is, if you're judging for an award and the book is nominated and you haven't you don't know anything around the book and someone nominates the book, then you're like, well, I need, you know, it's like that one time that the 13th book in the book of Stephen Saga was nominated for a Hugo. And everybody was like, you don't need to read the rest of the books because it's about a different character. And yet, <laughs> if you had not read the other books, that one character was insufferable and you wanted to punch him in his mug sexist face the entire time well slash like i just could never do that like you said that sentence out loud my skin literally crawled i was like i can't I mean, no you just can't but there's so much it's not like you're telling me to skip the first book in a series and then read the second one it's like no, no, what do you mean you can just like yeah, yeah. you can't just skip them you it just like gives me reader hives I mean, like, no, also, that is 
also i really really like sawbones um so i'm i'm completely primed to listen to the mcelroy's play dnd it's just i haven't done it yet i and just I know... like i love them so much i just like i love the mcelroy brothers so much they're such good good boys i haven't um listened to that uh, myself but i've heard a lot about it and my partner's really into that uh, mm -hmm. that whole thing so i'm kind of like yeah. in the in the um weird zone where i know what what's going on and what's what's about but it's like a broken telephone thing where you where you only hear about it through someone else like that time that uh john hadn't seen any game of thrones but he was like oh sean bean is the king and he gets he gets killed no, <laughs> okay but bean to be fair is, if sean bean is anything you have a 95 percent chance of being right if you say that sean bean gets killed like sometime before the end of the thing that he's in which I is mean, very unfortunate for sean bean to be fair um the zeitgeist of game with you know if you don't want well, yes, to yes, you will still hear, hear a load of shit about oh, yeah. game of thrones so i know people who don't watch it who can carry on a passable enough car it's d d dragons and winter coming and there's a queen and like you can you get enough from just like being in the general pop culture atmosphere under not a rock <laughs> Oh man, they just keep teasing it, and I'm like, it's not even out for like a gajillion years, and then it's only gonna be like six episodes long. Everybody just needs to calm down. That's an exaggeration. It's Are actually gonna be, like, be like eight episodes? or nine. I can't do, dude. I can't. I listen. I watch Game of Thrones. I like Game of Thrones. I don't even know if I can sit through seven two hour long episodes of Game of Thrones. That is Look, the a lot of is, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones comes out on a Sunday night in the US, which means I get to watch it on a Monday morning and I don't work on Mondays. So I'm like, okay, I can do that, I guess. Six Mondays in a row for you, Game of Thrones. But like only because I'm far enough down this trash fandom that I like cannot stop myself from caring. Like it's you know it's just well, like it's like <laughs> the, the TV show was so good when it was like the TV show was good when it was sticking very very close to the book and then as soon as it started not sticking close to the book it's like oh you're actually not very good at telling your story are you <laughs> I am so although they pulled it back for the last season that last season slapped a little bit I was not unhappy with several of the things that happened in the most I, recent season of Game of Thrones I'm still mad that those guys have like have Star Wars movies in the works because like yeah. really really I mean, like, no thing. really the medium the media men behind that show are garbage trash like as is true most of the time that have that confederate thing on the yep. works yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, it it sure do. Because that was like the whole thing was like, no, this, like, I'm sorry, like, I'm in the, I know I'm in the like unpopular opinion category because I just don't think that any of and Weiss are like, they are not very, the most talented of um, screenwriters. I said that. I just said that. I said it stopped being good when it's not. Thank you for being on my side, side on because side. like 90% of the internet is not. Uh, okay. But yeah. Yeah. For the don't like when they announced that they were gonna do Confederate, and I also, was like, like, I don't care if Ben F and Weiss are the best storytellers in the world. Like some stories just aren't yours to tell, especially on HBO. Like no, yeah, not, please let's cancel yeah. it. I do not want it. Also, like that particular story has been told like so many times. Like it's the it's practically the same thing like what if the nazis won and philip k dick has made a career like made a career out of that and you know it's been like, done before yeah like it's, oh. it's not original and people were like well it's it's a new new fresh I also idea. Like, no, have no. a tiny problem with that because like while the nazis did technically lose it's also not like we live in a nazi free world so it's like yeah, no, uh no. they they they're I, gone they're not eradicated they're not like figures of fantasy this is maybe like not my favorite alternative history that we're doing yeah like i just can like can we just end the whole grim dark tv show thing and go like can i have my fluffy stuff now like i have endured so many of these like uh blue and green filtered uh 
slaughter fests? Like, can I have mm-hmm. my sweet uh, fairy tale retellings of like colorful costumes and such that have a little bit of like hope? Because Grimdark is not escapism mm-hmm. anymore. When is the new Fruits Basket anime airing and how can I see it? Oh, did, you yeah, yeah. Break up, did you see the new trailer for it? They just I have. They just announced like uh, where they showed every of every one of the main cast uh, uh, with their new voice actor, and I was like, Ooh. I was a bit shocked that Yuki has a male voice actor now. I'm I'm Ooh. so used to I'm so used to hearing him like with a female voice actor that I was I was thrown <laughs> a little. I was like, wait, what? Not my Yuki. It's been so so long. I read those. I read the manga in high school, and yeah, so like I, it's just I, been delightful I, listening to your yeah. videos, uh, Rachel, when you were rereading it. Because I was like, you know, I was kind of like, I don't really. My library doesn't have it, and I don't. I'm not gonna buy all of it again to reread it because that's too much. You know, I can't. Even I cannot make sense of that. That's that's silly. That would be silly. But like, it does sound delightful, and I wish I could. You know, it sounds like such a good time. I just want the next volume of Fence to come out. I'm very upset that the most like next trade volume of Fence is not out yet because I'm all caught up. Yeah, and like, how much more of Fence are we gonna get though? Because like, it can't tell. Uh, I hope enough to see smooching. There hasn't been smooching. We better get some smooching in Fence before it's over. I will die on this tiny hill. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I think smooching is planned, right? Because I heard an interview from the writers of Fence. I would be shocked. Yeah. Um, I heard an interview from the writer and the illustrator of Fence with like Ga- uh, mm-hmm. Gabby Big White Law. Um, mm-hmm. A million years ago, on one of her podcasts that she does for Daily Dot, and they were talking. Yeah. They, they are from fandom, and they're like clearly just like planned it as you know. And so it's a, mm-hmm. I just, I just. At oh, some I point, would be shocked if we don't get it. At some point, someone yeah, agreed yeah. said something like, "Oh, isn't there supposed to be a really short series with only this many like trades?" And I was like, "No." Yeah, so I think up to volume eight or nine, something like that. Like, I mean, it's really, it's really, it's it's not been very fast moving so far, you know. I mean, no. To be fair, it all revolves around a fencing tournament, so it's not exactly like the uh, most high stakes of thrilling, but also it's much more about just like several levels of queer tension, and I like it. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've liked a contemporary, like non fantastical or SF like graphic novel so it was fun to find like a cool fourth romance one it's hilarious because last um, in 2018 I just realized when I was nominating for the Book to Best Earth Awards and I had nothing to nominate in graphic works even though I was like let me judge that I love comics because <laughs> last year I read Fex I read <laughs> Giant Days I read <laughs> Check Please like five times and and that's what I re- you know aside from continuing things that I had been reading previously mm-hmm. like Sender and Saga and um uh blah, 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 the time travelly one uh, Paper Girls you know like aside from those which mm-hmm. are all at like a which are all like at volume like four or five or something or more. Mm-hmm. Um, I just not really read anything new that in any any new speculative comics. Yeah, I think I just realized this is the year I'm gonna have to give up on trying to both stay caught up with new stuff to nominate and get caught up on the stuff from the previous year that I didn't get to read that was nominated. Like every year I try to make my brain stretch to handle both categories of books and it's just like, no, I'm not we're not doing this this year. So Yeah, I'm I'm hopelessly behind on comics because I kind of stopped reading while I was in grad school, partially because, like, I didn't have time, but also, like, even with using the library, like, it was just really difficult to keep up to date and buying, buying books in Canada was just ridiculously expensive on a grad student budget. 
Mm -hmm. Plus, like, I always kind of lose track of when the trades are coming out. Like, I don't read in single issues, so there's no, like, you know, going to the pull list on Tuesday or whatever. So, like, I just kind of lose track of when the next trade my, buy them my is coming local out. Shop, my local shop has a pull list for me of vol of trades. Like, they I, know what I yeah. want. They, I'm sure you can like, go in and sell one up. They just, like, they put them as, you know, I mean... I, and I'm not saying for me as, like, I'm so special. Like, they just... No, like, and I'm sure if I went into my comic book shop, they would let me do it. That gets more into my reticence of, like, the local comic book shops in the area and the general, like, atmosphere of comic book shops and, like, my desire to actually physically go into one. Yeah, I'm... <laughs> I, you know, I, we are very fortunate with our local, so I'm not gonna, you know... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know one of the saddest thing, one of the saddest things about you know the fact that I don't want to like pinpoint my location too closely on the internet because you know safety that's creepy because you're a human being <laughs> yeah. uh, is that I don't I can't like shout about how much I love my local comic book store because mm -hmm. you know um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, uh, Michael in chat says, I don't read DC or Marvel because they reboot so many times. It's not even funny. It's not. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's been several comics. years. It's so annoying. Well, and so the thing is, so like for me, especially, like I used to be a hardcore DC person. Like in high school, my pull list was pretty much exclusively DC because I got in just as they had done the new 52 and the one year later, which was a really good jumping on point for me. And then when I went to university, they did the new 52 and I was pissed because Oracle was one of my favorite characters and they just completely erased her from continuity. And so I just stopped reading DC for a long time. This is around the time when Marvel rebooted uh, Captain Marvel and it was like getting started with um, Kamala. And so I started reading more Marvel, but now I'm just like, I tend to just pick up Miss Marvel and trade and have no idea what's going on with anything else. Yeah. I was doing that. And then Miss Marvel did this massive crossover that I was just like, no, this is this. Mm. The problem is, the problem is they make no sense of the characters as established. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. also not a fan. And like, Marvel does this, oh, I don't, because I, like I said, I haven't really been reading a whole lot of DC. I like, we'll read Wonder Woman and that's about it at this point. Um, mm -hmm. I'm waiting for them to inevitably reboot Birds of Prey because I need that in my life again. Um, but anyway, like DC doesn't tend to do like the same type of crossover events that Marvel has an unfortunate habit of doing where everything gets dragged into it. DC is more likely to do mini series and like mm -hmm. have one shots related to it that inevitably reboot the universe, which is annoying. Um, but yeah, DC tends to do more like standalones, like now, like my impression is DC tends to do more standalone stuff, whereas Marvel tends to do more like Civil War, Civil War II, where everyone gets involved and it's annoying because characters aren't acting the way they should act because the folks Didn't on higher- Did you see my like, Civil War face? Oh, uh, don't get well, it. Well, it's like part of it, like there's a quality thing, but there's also like part of me like, I can see when you just want my money. And I can see when you're not doing a thing that's actually for like story purposes. You just want me to continue to buy things so I understand what's going on in your big crop. Like, and like, no. Also, like, my issues with Marvel go like deeper. I have some issues with like some of the ethical creative choices that they've made over the course of like the last five ish years or so. I mean, yeah, they've published a lot of racist shit and enabled a lot of racist people and also abuse and stuff but, so like i was following that. kamala khan when tanahasi kids did his black panther run i followed that for like so like he dipped in and out but i just think they're they're so complicated i've asked so many times for like the easiest way to read this thing and never gotten just like a straight these are the three books you need to read and they're all in a row and that's it and i'm just like it's yeah, and too I will, much and i will say again for dc i think because I don't know. And again, this might be because, like my, my own personal bias, but I find like even with like the random new 52 rebirth, wh whatever fuck they're calling their latest 
re relaunch attempt. Like I still find them easier to understand than the whole, oh, well, Ileana Rasputin like was sucked into hell and then aged and then died and then she was de-aged and then there's like five different versions of Everybody froze a little bit for me. Yeah. Um, I like, yeah, I like Jay and Miles explain yeah. the X-Men a lot. Um, that's the only reason I know anything about like the X-Men other than um Jane Grey will not die. All my like, X-Men knowledge comes from Cherrick fanfic. Like this so yeah, also, yes, first of all. Claire, yes, affirmative. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I just feel like, and I know this isn't really true, but like, I feel like I kind of missed the comics boat when I was a kid. Like, I feel like I was like in my little like nerd canoe and the river forked and there was like comic book space nerd. And then there was like Tolkien fairies and elves nerd. And I just like paddled right down that path. And I feel like I kind of like missed my entrance to comics just like as a thing. So now trying to like be an adult and hop back on that like train is just proving uh, slightly more daunting that's why i like like limited series contemporary stuff runoffs things that have already started like after i got to the place <laughs> yeah, i mean I yeah also like i was into comics when i was little you know but like we had different comics like the, mm -hmm. the, the marvel and dc comics are so deeply steeped into like anglophone and specifically american like culture which is not to say they're yeah. bad but it is to say that we just didn't have them in france because mm -hmm. france is very much like you know they'll they'll dub um hollywood movies so that we get to see them in french when they come out you know we get a lot of translated books but we don't actually get a lot of translated comics because we have a thriving industry for bande dessinée in like france and belgium and like just f general francophone works mm -hmm. that's very that's much very... what i grew up on like french yeah. comics like valerian and uh oh, Tintin so and uh Stop. That's I, yeah, say, yeah. I was a tin tin when I was younger. My library actually had a really large Charles Schultz and a really large tin tin collection. Mm -hmm. See, I wasn't into comics until it was like it was two two things. One, I started watching Teen Titans. Um, so the not Teen Titans Go, but the original, and like that got me interested in DC. And then I also started watching Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, which I think. Like even if you don't aren't familiar with DC, it's worth watching those shows because it's just such a good intro to who these characters like the best like my favorite versions of these characters. And then mm -hmm. um, my dad at the time lived fairly close to a really nice comic book store in Oakland, Doctor Comics and Mister Games, and um, we would my sister and I would go there and I would just like flip through the single issues, which is how I got started reading. Teen Titans and then Birds of Prey. And so that was kind of my intro into comics was those two shows. And also just convenience. Mm -hmm. I had a subscription to Spiral Magazine. Like get comics, get like a comic magazine subscription to my house for literal years until my dad was like, aren't you too old for that comic book subscription? And I was like, no, no. So I think that's that's awesome. That's how I, we rarely bought books, but we're such heavy library users. Like I can distinctly remember charting basically my like literary development in like summer binges. There was like the summer I did all the Dear America books. And then there was the summer I did all the Goosebumps books. And then there was the summer I did every Tamora Pierce book that was in the library. And then there was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. And then I went there with the Stephen King and I just like progressively got further and further like away from like the young adult and middle grade sections into like the adult stuff. But like, it was always just whatever the library had. So I've read like the second, third, six eighth and ninth book in some series and like just never gotten back to the other ones yeah one of both the best and worst parts about having an after school job um when i was in high school was i bought so many comics and i still have like i got rid of a bunch of them in various moves but i still have a bunch of the ones that i bought like over 10 years ago now mm -hmm. 
I also had a um, subscription um, magazine for Donald Duck. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like the most popular comic book magazine in Finland, even to this day, for some reason. So are those translated into Finnish then? Because they're for kids, right? Um, yeah, like they are translated into Finnish, but also there's like a real huge, like, Finnish Donald Duck comic book artist like group that does the magazine. So there are like exclusive Donald Duck stories huh. that are by That's Finnish amazing. authors. So and recently there was this like rap star who is huge in Finland, like a Finnish rapper, which is like an oxy like, like yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, a Finnish rapper who wrote one of the Donald Duck stories. And there was this huge splash, like, read this Donald Duck story. And it was, like, weird. <laughs> okay, so I have a question about this, because you're calling it Donald Duck. And I'm wondering if the magazine is called Donald Duck in Finnish, right? Because... Um, no, no, it's called Aku Anka. But does it, is it, is that in reference to Donald, like, the character of Donald? Yeah, like, um, Duck mean like Anka means duck so yeah. it's basically a translated name like every every name is translated and sure. they're very big on like puns so makes sense and also if there's like a celebrity reference for like a foreign celebrity like a hollywood celebrity then they try to have like a finnish equivalent for the ah. celebrity instead of like um, ha having a reference to a foreigner, unless, like, for example, if there's an Arnold Schwarzenegger reference, that's that's obviously uh, such a well-known person that even us Finns will know him. Uh, because I, w I was asking, because in French, obviously, they also uh, translate the stories because it's for kids, um, but the... Um, I guess they don't really sell. They don't really sell magazines. They sell. Um, they sell like big, like chunky, collected books that are like yeah. you know. Uh, here's it's like both. You can buy the yeah. like trade paperbacks or mass market paperbacks in the like supermarkets and stuff. But they also have the magazine. And mm. I remember when I was a kid in the nineties, uh, they had this editor's corner where they would always post like disney related news like all the like lion king is coming in the next two months and here's the here's an interview with the finnish cast and stuff so mm. that was probably like my favorite part of the whole magazine was that whole editor's corner but the the, the omnibus books that we had they were like half comics and half like little games that you could do like you know like a little like maze or whatever or yeah a puzzle or you know wordplay or whatever and um the magazine is called after um scrooge mcduck but in french i mean i know scrooge is a reference to ebenezer scrooge and it's yeah. not positive but in french his name is uncle picsou which is a pun for like which means like money thief <laughs> um and like literally the translated the new the new um ducktail series the new ducktail series if you listen to the theme in english it's all about having adventures and stuff if you listen to the theme in french it's all about like how uncle pick uh, uncle Picsou like is super rich and like stealing money from the people it's quite like <laughs> It's very anti-capitalist, Claire. It's so it's really funny. That's hilarious. It's about how rich he is. Yeah, in American stuff are just a show about these three annoying ducks and their very rich uncle. And also their other very clueless uncle, Donald. Mm -hmm. So But the new voice cast has David Tennant and Danny Pudi. And Ben Schwartz, who I love. Jean Ralphio is the best. I love him to death. Um, so I only found this because Sam Riegel's the voice director for um, DuckTales. And for folks who don't know, Sam Riegel's a cast member on Critical Role. Um, and his day job is voice directing a lot of the Disney shows. Anyway, um, 
he at Disneyland hosted like a live table read. And so they had a bunch of the cast there. And um, the joke is with ben, the duck that Ben Schwartz plays. And I can't remember which one it is. I don't remember which one of the ones it is. He was like is. only speaking with like stuff that was programmed into like a keytar or like a keyboard. And it was really funny. There's a video of Ben Schwartz playing a pipe organ at one of the universities that he's speaking to that is very cute. If you get the chance to watch it, I highly recommend. Ooh. Okay, follow me down this path, friends. Speaking of DuckTales, who features a voice Lynn manuel Miranda character, did we see the new Philip Pullman trailer for his Dark Materials also featuring Lynn manuel Miranda? Yeah, um, I, know, me. But I saw Tor.com just post uh, post about it on Twitter, so I need to mm -hmm. check it out later. It's not really, I mean, it's only like little snippets. It's like, like, it's like 30 seconds of names with like pictures of their faces, kind of, but like that. Yeah. Yeah, but you can see the costumes and it's, you know, look, the thing is, it can't be worse than the movie was. <laughs> I just like it makes me very sad because Phil Fulman is a transphobe and that will always break oh, yeah, my heart. But like the movie looks good. Like the movie looks like it could actually be a thing that is good. Unlike the last time they tried to <laughs> make the call. Well, I think it's, I think it will help that it's a series and not a, a not movie. A, because they'll have more yeah. time to like let shit breathe and hopefully not screw up the ending. I was so sad the way they did Seraphina Peckle wrong. In the Golden Compass, I just want to see the witches done right. I mean, the thing about the thing about people that you like in the UK is that if if they don't have a Twitter street, if they don't have a Twitter feed full of like, oh my god, stop being dicks to trans people, support trans people, support trans rights, it's like 50-50, They're like a massive asshole trans who is, you know like a concern troll and a massive transphobe. And it is sad, but every time that I need to like, that I want to like retweet an article from the Guardian or, you know, something or the, the independent or something like that, like the bloody new statesman is crawling with them, you know, yeah. to check. Like, you know, there's a new book out about like how the, 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 the the gender the workplace design one, that one? Yeah, the one about the uh, design of, like, safety research for, like, crash car dummies and stuff like that is all done mm. with men. And you know the thing about, like, how you're always called in an office because they did the research for the temperature of offices based on dudes, and so all yeah. the offices are always, like, five degrees cold, too cold for women, and we're all in, yeah. like, sweaters, and all Shocking. the men are, like, you little ladies are ridiculous. Shocking like, everyone, the world is built on misogyny. Literally everything in the world is misogynist. Yeah, but that book was written by, like, someone who's a master. And yeah. so, because the, the author is a an exclusionary so-called radical feminist, so-called feminist, like, because she's so exclusionary and because the book like in itself that idea about the de the gendered aspects of design like that's already super gender essentialist by the nature mm -hmm. of it like i want the yeah, person working to within the binary handle it really well. right and you know that's not the author's fault that's like an aspect of the of the subject but i would like someone to like handle that with mm -hmm. with care and yeah. No. It's almost like we were talking earlier. It's a way different thing, but like you were saying with to like Tony, I didn't. It's just like where are your people? Like if you're going to talk about something like that, you need to have your people who can read it and tell you what's going on. But also, I get the very much so strong opinion that turfs don't really give a shit. So. Oh no, turfs don't give a shit. No, 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 no. no. Because like, <laughs> the whole thing is like it claims to be about women and feminism and supporting women, and yet it continues to want to define womanhood. In well, and then terms like of bodies, and like I don't like stay the fuck away from my body and other people's yeah. bodies. Like, like, yeah, and then, like, there's that. There's the whole thing with them being like, "Oh, queer is a slur," and it's like you will pry a queer from my cold dead hands. You fu you fuck you fucked. 
Yeah. Same, you fuck with. Yeah. Same. Like I like I've had to like go through so much like self reflecting and that whole like trauma uh, of trying to fit into a certain mold. So for me, like having queer as a way to describe myself is a safe thing and it it like relieves anxiety um of like having to be a certain way so i'm like every time someone is like you can't use this word even like i wouldn't use it to describe someone who doesn't want to be described as queer like but for me but for myself like no i'm going to keep calling myself that like yeah. Well, First like, of all, let other people self-identify. It's not yeah. your business. <laughs> Second of all, like, I have, I mean, you know, I've, 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 I've never met a queer person that doesn't use the term queer about themselves. Uh, like in in like my group of friends. Um, but that's neither here nor there, and it's really not my. Anyway, someone else talk. Well, like, it's just one of those things where it's like anyone, anyone that, you know, it's difficult for people who are kind of outside the group in question to say in any way, right or wrong, like, you can't do that. Like, like you were saying, Rhea, it's very much so. It's like, if you don't want to use that term, like, yeah. cool beans, yo. And if you don't want that term used about you, like, mad respect, we can do that. But like, you yeah, won't turn around and then tell me that I can't use the words that I'm most comfortable with to talk about yeah. myself. Yeah, and then like, and then I like for me, especially like I come from a queer family, like that's the best way I can describe it. And like, that's the yeah. same. a lot of other people that I know who have either, um, who have LGBTQ parents or guardians. It's like, we're, we have queer families and like the term that a lot of us use is queer spawn. And it's mm -hmm. very much reclaiming that word and being proud of the fact that we have queer families. So again, they will pry it from my cold, dead hands. Well, and also for, for me individually, it's just like, it's it's easier, dude. Like, do you really want to hear my, like, four gender and sexuality identifiers? Like, because I could, we can go through all of it, or I could just say that I'm queer and then we can just not worry about it anymore. Yeah, like, for example, like, not to, like, go too into it, but... I've had that thing where I was very strict about what my label was. Like I identified as um, lesbian for like, I identified as gay for like uh, the majority of my life. And it was this huge process of having to come to terms with the fact that I like wasn't. And um, also at the time that I had to go through that, there was this like, a lot of talk about bi erasure and biphobia and uh, exclusionary behavior in the LGBT community. So I was like, really scared about coming out as bisexual. So having queer as a word kind of helped me bridge that gap where I didn't really know um, how to identify and how to kind of fit into a certain mold. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's there's also that like let just let people have their have their identifiers just yeah i'll not, also never much understand that i just why 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 do you care why do you other person have much care what because, words i use to define myself like a, a lot of people like controlling marginalized bodies <sighs> put a pound sigh heavy sigh because it's so true yeah friends we are coming. We are coming close to to the end of uh, the time slot that we uh, that we have planned. Oh no! Oh no! Uh, do you guys have anything you want to shout about that you're like looking forward to reading or making or watching? Uh, no, I get Marvel. to make. Go ahead, there. Captain Marvel comes out in two weeks, and oh my God, oh my God, I'm oh my excited God. about it. And okay, did you anyone? just do the? Did if you guys anyone, see the two? Go ahead, there. Oh, if anyone like needs something to like brighten their day, Marvel on Friday did a live stream of Goose the Cat, just like <sighs> chilling and walking around and wanting pets and sleeping and making biscuits and yeah. So if you like need something cute, watch that. 
I was also gonna say, I don't know if you guys saw, I think Preeti Chipper retweeted it, but there's two guys, I think they may be French. Uh, there's a white guy and a black guy and they're two really good friends and they've made Marvel stuff before, but basically they made this like three minute movie in their hallway, just like shouting about Captain Marvel and how great it was gonna be and how if you don't go see Captain Marvel because she's a lady, you're really stupid. And like, <laughs> it was just a very, it was just a very nice video. Like it made me very warm inside because these two dudes are very goofy, but they share a lot of enthusiasm for Captain Marvel. Uh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I mean, I'm also super excited about Captain Marvel, but a uh, tangent that I thought about uh, when Diamond and Goose the Cat, um, our friend Brie, who's one half of Kit Roker, just got a puppy. Oh my yes! God, her new puppy is so cute. Puppy. And she already has like a grown up dog that's super excited about being a big sister to the puppy. There is nothing like watching a huge, because her other dog is like basically a tiny horse. Like it's giant. And this new puppy is like the size of her. So it's like watching this giant dog, like watching this giant dog figure out how to play with, but not destroy this tiny dog. is just, it's been a very cute weekend. I feel like I need to do like a, a recommendation list somewhere of like good Twitter accounts for, for pet pictures. Mm -hmm. Alyssa Cole's always posting pictures of her cat Tico, who is very adorable and her chickens she lives in the hot they have chickens um one of my favorite <laughs> twitter accounts to follow is i don't actually like i will link that somewhere um for my twitter or something but um there's this turkish guy who takes and rescue cats and he plays piano and the and the cats listen to the piano and are just like fully immersed in the music and he plays like his own compositions for them and they're like there there's been like videos he's um he's linked where there's like eight cats all around the piano and they're all listening to the like song and it's it's so wholesome it makes me so happy every time every time he appears on my feed i'm like stop everything i'm doing and just watch the video yeah uh, quick plug, the Oscars are tonight. I will be watching the Oscars tonight. It's probably going to be a hot mess, but I will still be watching. I watch every year. It, it's, oh. it's 9 p.m. here right now, and uh, we went to bed at like 5.30 a.m. this morning because of like the stuff with John's massive long video. So yeah. I think I'm going to try and like, I don't know how I'm going to get to actually sleep tonight because I of just, that. Like, girl, you know, I would way sleep over the Oscars. Bed. I would wait till tomorrow. You can catch those wrap ups on Buzzfeed. I would yeah, sleep yeah, before yeah. I watch the Oscars. No, <laughs> yeah. no, I'm not intending to watch the Oscars. I'm yeah. worried that I'm not, I'm worried. I'm not that actually going to sleep. Not sleep. But I think I'm just gonna like go to bed at a decent time with like hot chocolate and try and read and finish. Well, not finish space opera because like there's 200 more pages of that lush. Plus, that list. book is a fucking trip, man. That is not the book <laughs> I would take to bed with me to like snuggle up for my relaxing nighttime read. I mean, it's not like bad, but that book is a fucking trip. All Catherine uh, <laughs> Wayne is like a very I would think would be a very fun place to get to go like hang out. I mean. Look, I was talking about how trippy it is before uh, before you uh, came on earlier, and like I'm I'm not I'm not getting through a whole lot of it um, in 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 a, in a go. So I don't know. I might try something else before bed and try reading that like at a different time of day. But yeah, yeah, I found with that one I had to be actually awake to read. Yeah, it. that was like my noon lunch, having had a cup of coffee, like reading the book. I think I'm also gonna watch the Oscars tonight because I've already ruined my sleeping schedule. So I, well, I I'm don't literally know. just watching for best song. I just want to see if Lady Gaga wins best song, and if Bradley, yeah. I want to see if they make a Bradley Cooper pissing his pants joke. That's what I really want to see. see. That's what I'm really looking for. Wins uh, best animated picture. I Which one? Sorry, did you say? Spider Verse. I want to see if Into the Spider Verse wins Best Animated Picture. I mean, I really, really, I really want to. See what else would? I mean, you know, look, I've not think... seen any of the other ones, but clearly it should win. It was like one of my favorite movies I've seen this year. Like it was, it was really, it was so inventive in terms of the actual like, like that's like it's basically what I like to call, anim call animation porn. Like every frame is a masterpiece. Sure. 
And it's always fun because the animators for that movie have been like doing a bunch of Twitter threads recently. I'm like, yeah. how it is that they did it? And it's always super yeah. fascinating it's, to hear them talk I, about I it. it. Like, I want to like have the Blu-ray from that movie where they have a bunch of like behind the scenes features. And then I want to watch all of those. I just want the favorite to win everything. I just want the big gay favorite with my beloved Rachel Weisz to win all the awards. Look. Olivia Coleman is a I love fucking her so natural much. treasure. I love She's her so much. I've been telling you how fucking great Olivia Coleman is for a fucking million okay, years. So, and now okay, you see so, me. I also would not be totally heartbroken if Glenn Close won, only because Glenn Close has never actually won before. And like, give the woman a fucking break. Hi. Give her a um, fucking break. So, so, side note, like, complete tangent. I will admit to always being very confused about Olivia Coleman and Olivia Williams. <laughs> Because look, <laughs> where I get them confused, and I have to remember which one is like the Broad Church Olivia versus which one is the Dollhouse Olivia. Oh, but, yeah. it's an unfortunate game to have to play. That <laughs> look, I mean, they're both good. Yeah, it's just like it literally is. I keep getting confused which one is which. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I remember Olivia, but I, I remember Olivia Coleman. I was introduced to Olivia Coleman after I moved to the UK. I didn't like see her on TV when these things were first airing, but she's in a lot of like comedy. I mean, she was in some of those like comedy improv groups that turned out, you know, in hindsight to contain like 10 people out of like 15 who went on to be quite famous and mm -hmm. you know so it's one of those things where you watch some early stuff and you're like oh it's this person and this person and this person and this person and she wasn't she was in a show called green wing which is amazing uh it's just like absurding absurdist show about a hospital with times and gray and um stephen mangan and julian green tut's beautiful hair um I, mm. Someone mentioned it on Twitter the other day, and now I'm like, I just really need to watch a Green Wing again. It's such nonsense. It's so beautiful. Anyway. And now she has a chance at an Oscar. Oh my God. You know. I'm just, I don't know, forever conflicted about the Oscars, but they're like my favorite award show of all the award shows. So I I'll still be watching. I don't really care all that much. Oh, I mean, I don't either, but this is like a Super Bowl for sports people. Yeah, but Chelsea, like, your favorite award show of all the award show is like a real thing, whereas my favorite award show is the Hugo's, and I'm just like, oh my god, oh my god. Okay, that doesn't even count, though. Like, that's valid. not even count. I don't even put the Hugo's in the same, like, to me, the Hugo's go more in the categories of, like, the National Book Awards or something like that. It's, like, not the same category as, like, the Emmys or the Oscars. It's like not quality wise, but just like types of media wise. I don't mix my books and my like visual media in quite that yeah. same fashion. That's I mean, fair. I'm gonna I say I don't have like a favorite it. media. I don't have like a favorite like TV and film awards then. That's mm -hmm. what I mean. Like, you know, I'm just like like in like my ner my own brand of fandom and nerdiness is like nerdy about books and fanish about tv if that makes sense you know mm -hmm. film like i don't give a shit about tv and film canon just like oh tv and film i'll be on ao3 <laughs> books i'll follow all the authors on twitter and like actually be invested in what happens in the actual thing whereas I mean, yes but i also just think like canon is more suggestion than a set of rules anyway it doesn't matter what your media is canon is just a set of suggestions I mean, I I just went ahead and bought a spaceship, uh, spaceship uh, themed clutch to have mm -hmm. and in the Hugo Awards this year when we're going to nice. Do. And the Hugo Awards are the only awards I'll actually get up for. Like I've gotten up at crazy various different hours in the day to watch, try and watch the usually non-functioning live streams. <laughs> the Hugo Awards. Every year that they will have a functioning live stream, but at this point, it's, it's like a tradition. Nope. I, mean, I hope for every year, and then I just end up watching the live tweet every year. It's, yeah, just, it's the I, same pattern. I follow the live tweet because I don't. I'm also normally like at work when oh, fair or enough. like doing something else yeah. when you go happening so i mean to be in fairness to the hugo like people this year um 
the person, I think, all right, don't quote me on this, but one of the people in charge of the Hugos this year is Nicholas White, who was doing, who was, I think he's like vice, uh, he's like um, deputy head of the Hugo team this year, and he was mm-hmm. head of the Hugo team in Helsinki, where they did a much better job of making the whole Hugo experience um, internet accessible than Mm -hmm. other years have done. You mean they didn't live stream the Hugo nominations from like three (laughs) different bars on like Periscope? I'm pretty sure those are just on phones, Di. I'm pretty sure everybody just held up their phone at the same time and hit record. Uh, Listen, I can talk a lot of trash, but I have never been on ConCom. I have never run a con. Uh, I have very limited floor-based volunteering experience. I'm not actually here to talk shit on anybody who runs a con because I couldn't do it and have never done it. But like Rhea said, it's just a little bit of tradition to be like, I'm going to watch the live stream. No, I won't. No, I'm not. I'm just kidding. I won't actually be doing that. <laughs> Bless you convention folks. The world couldn't function without you. I will Bless still you all for your time the last year's we Hugo and how they announced the nominations just because that was a particular particular shit show. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's always I, think it's important, I think it's important to look at it and be like, what does this tell us about the way that these people are viewing conventions and convention mm-hmm. going? And, you know, like how they all you know I mean they clearly they clearly didn't consider the vast amount of people who like care about having a decent yeah. like a quality announcement online. And there's always room for improvement for for accessibility and tech stuff. There's always room for improvement. And I imagine as the as that part of the Hugo's continues to like go on and become more and more important, the infrastructure and like support behind getting all of that like up and functioning and ready to go will improve. And, And like from what I've like in the last like few years that I've been like really actively following this stuff, um I feel like in the like technological age that we're in and in the internet age it's just another like hurdle that every convention needs to kind of clear pass and Mm -hmm. like every convention is improving on the last one and that's like really important like i feel like they are actively listening to the community and the things that the community wants to see and they are actively making progress to ensure the best experience for attendees and those who Mm -hmm. are not attending. I mean, I don't know. I feel like it's really unfair for me to say that because I was involved. I was a volunteer for Worldcon 76 and 75 in Helsinki. I'm a volunteer for Dublin Worldcon and I wasn't a volunteer for Worldcon 76 in San Jose. But I do feel part of the reason people were annoyed at that particular announcement online is it felt like a step back from the previous year. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah. It was Um, a big step back. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't want to, like, throw massive amounts of shade because I'm on the programming team for for Dublin Worldcon and, like, I'm behind. So I have to, like, take some time. I have to, like... I'm planning on specifically like taking a day off and like immersing myself and like hyper focusing on it, you know, like that good, like I'm going to now do convention things for like 10 hours. It's going to be bloody great, but yeah, it does take a long time. Um, and it's, you know, it's a lot of work. Uh, I just think, you know, most like a lot of issues can be solved by like, I don't know. I feel like a lot of it is, like, trying to have a bit of foresight. But, again, like, I just... I probably shouldn't say something like that because it's going to karma me in the arse, but... (laughs) I think it's, like, I, I understand the, like, feeling like you need to take a step back because you are actually, like, in the planning group and such. But at the same time, I feel like, like not to like throw shade at anyone or anything, but it's important to also take pride in what you got right. And like, you know, like tooting your own horn sometimes is completely like, like it's, it's fine. Well, you, I shall toot my own horn on once we've got it right. The thing is now we're working on it. So, you know. <laughs> 
but yeah uh speaking of i mean i think i we need to start wrapping up because the cat wants to be let out of this room um but uh before we let her in before we wrap up no she's just at the door now she wants to go out of this room because <laughs> you see she's eating in 45 minutes and so it's time to start um, staring at her ball until you feed her <laughs> no she makes a little cute barricade in the hallway every time i want to go somewhere and like meows at me it's cute um but I yeah i just wanted danger. to remind everybody uh every anyone who's still watching uh that um uh this is your psa youtube channels that talk about books like all of ours are eligible for best fan casts and you should consider them this is your Hugo Award PSA before uh, the um, before the end of the nomination period, and uh, we are also going to do one of these live streams uh, once a month. Nominally, they were for talking about our book scarves and blankets, which I made something, so I feel like that's you know. After the amount of sleep that I got last night, making half of a hexagon is perfectly fine. Um, but we do we know whose channel we're on next month? Uh, mine, I think, yeah, it's mine, cool. yeah, the great and Ray is in March. So, Ray's channel in March, we're going to uh, we're going to work on scheduling that because, as it's been pointed out in the chat, we've got UK, Finland, and like loads of US time zones. Yeah, so I should see the time zone like. <laughs> Rubik's cubes that need to be put together every time we're trying to get one of these things scheduled. Yeah, we're really, really <laughs> proud of us for like having been able to do this for like the past, I know, right? past two months. Yeah, in a and, um, like easy, yeah. easy manner. I'm also really proud of me because I managed to get my video for tonight rendered before the live stream, so that I'm actually going to be able to put it out like before 10 p.m. and not at two in the morning. Yay! So I'm well Yay, proud of myself. Yeah. <laughs> so look forward to genre wise coming up in like uh, an hour or so. Yes. Um, and uh, I'm gonna go. F I'm no, I'm not gonna go feed the cat because it's too early. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna go feed the clear because. <laughs> Good plan, friends. All right. Well, I'll catch you guys uh, next month sometime on yeah. Ray's channel. Yeah. Yay. Sounds good. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.